How far across is the lawn from one pavilion to the other pavilion, from the east side to the west side? Is it 257 yards? No. 257 yards is two and a half Scott stadiums, right? I mean, that's the way we measure things nowadays. Any guess? Pardon? 50 Close to 50 yards. It's about 180 feet from one to the other, depending on exactly where you, uh, yeah, very good, very good. Uh, the reason why I'm pointing this out is that Jefferson has had an idea that's been floating around his noggin for many years. Now he's got a chance to put it down. But this is just the preliminary idea, just as it, you write down a couple of sentences of your term paper. That's not the sentences you're going to wind up with, at least I hope not. Uh, you know, I mean, these are the beginning ideas. You've had these. Now you're putting them down. But then you're going to begin to fool with this and change this and so forth. So this is the preliminary sort of an idea. As I say, on the other side of this, he does have this elevation. This is done in graph paper, as you can see. I hope you can see here. Uh, this is a type of paper they discovered when he was in France. And he constantly imported it because it allowed him to uh, measure off uh, his drawings and so forth. And what he has here, this is what we call an architecture and elevation. This is a front. Here are the student rooms. You can see we have railings up above, which is sort of Chinese. Here is the ground plan right here. Here's the covered walkway. Here's the classroom. Here are student rooms. There's chimneys in between. Uh, you go in like this. Then there is a potty. There are two potties, one potty back here and another potty there. Uh, for the professor, you go in. Uh, on a, uh, you go in on the side door here, and you go upstairs. This is the, class, uh, the professor's or the teacher's rooms up here. He does not show a basement floor, which would, have, uh, uh, which would have the kitchen and all of that. So this is the way that, this is the, way the thing starts out. Uh, in the next two years, some of his political buddies, people by the name of Cabell and Cock, in particular, are able to maneuver through the state legislature a bill that establishes not Albemarle Academy, but Central College, Central College. And the state does determine that there is going to be a college called Central College. And so the evolution of our name is Albemarle Academy, then the Central College. The bill passed as legislature in 1816. They get a little bit of money and are able to begin to buy land begin to work on the site in 1817. We don't become officially the University of Virginia until January 1819. So it's important to keep these sorts of thing, these things in mind. And they begin to purchase some land. This is a scheme by Jefferson here that's not dated, and so this is just my rough dating on this. And I should say that most of these drawings are over in special collections uh, just next door, uh, over in the Harrison, uh, the Harrison building. Uh, this is sort of a scheme here for purchasing other land and so forth. This is the corners area right here. Uh, this is West Main Street coming up and what was Three Notched Road, which is today University Avenue. This road down here is what we call today JPA, uh, what was the old Lynchburg Road. And this is sort of a speculation of different lands and so forth that he's going to purchase uh, over the years. This is the initial area that is purchased, uh, is purchased right here. Uh, now, on this, and um, uh, Alexander Gillum will take this up a little bit later on, uh, there was one building near the site here, uh, which ultimately did become part of the university, and it was this right here, was Mr. Monroe's law office. This land and the land at the university had been owned by this guy by the name of John Perry, and Mr. Perry was a master mason. And he's the person that sells the land to the trustees of Central College. And he also goes into the construction. He's very, very much involved in the construction of the university. This is a story, as I say, that uh, 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 Sandy Gillum will take up a little bit later on, uh, but just to give you a clue. But this is about the only thing, uh, about the only thing uh, that was here. Uh, in, um, they, break, uh, they begin to level the ground. Uh, horses, mules, enslaved labor, free labor, uh, working on leveling the ground over there. Uh, but Jefferson uh, is a little concerned. He has just sold all of his books to the Library of Congress, including all of his architecture books. Now, being a good bibliomaniac, of he was, and he was of the first order, 
uh, he goes out and begins buying his books right back again. But he didn't have the architecture books, and so our supposition is that he writes two letters. The first of these here goes to Thornton, uh, and it's up here, Monticello, May 9.17, Dear Sir, down here at the bottom, Dr. Thornton. And in this letter, Jefferson says, we're going to start a central college. Would you send me some suggestions for the front of the pavilions? There's still no rotunda at this point, front of the pavilions. And what Thornton sends back is a letter, and he sends back this watercolor right here. Uh, and as you can see, his, you'll see in a minute, his rendering techniques is a little bit better than Jefferson. Thornton, Dr. William Thornton, was the first architect of the United States Capitol. He was in that cartoon I showed you a few minutes ago. He was the first architect of the United States Capitol, was a buddy of Jefferson. Uh, uh, and so Jefferson's writing off, asking, uh, writing off to him asking for ideas. Uh, this is what he sends back, as you can see here. Uh, for the central pavilion, this is Jefferson right here, grass and trees, sort of showing this rough scheme for this. Uh, sends this back here, the central one to be like this, the other eight to be like this. And it's not too hard to see. Uh, that on October 6th, 1817, they break ground, lay the cornerstone for pavilion, what we call today Pavilion Number 7. And let me just say that the numbers of the pavilions do change over time. Uh, they're not all originally with these numbers on them. Uh, but you can see the relationship of Pavilion Number 7 uh, is not quite the same. Uh, Thornton has actually Corinthian capitals. Jefferson simplifies it to Doric. Uh, and of course, there is uh, the pitch of the roof is a little bit different here in the pediment, uh, insertion of a window, but it's basically the sort of, uh, the sort of Jefferson scheme. Um, a few days after getting the letter back from Thornton, Jefferson writes exactly the same letter to another architect buddy of his by the name of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Mr. Latrobe was the second architect of the United States Capitol. Thornton quit in 1803 while Jefferson was president, he'd had it dealing with Congress. And Jefferson appoints Latrobe to be the second architect of the United States Capitol. Latrobe was British born, but came over in 1795, lands in Norfolk, does a bunch of work down in the Richmond area, then winds up up in Philadelphia, and becomes a very, very central figure in development of American architecture. And he's very much a buddy of Jefferson's as well. Anyway, Thornton, excuse me, Latrobe writes back this letter right here, and as you can see, it's written in a very acidic ink that bleeds through the paper, and that's the reason why it's a little difficult to read at times. But what he suggests is that the center building ought to be a domed structure. And then he has some suggestions. If you look very, very closely, you can see that he has some other things here. But notice this is still this huge, wide open type of a scheme. What happens is several fold. One thing is that Jefferson begins to realize that that big 257 yard scheme wasn't going to work. There was no way that they could level it. Now maybe today with Caterpillar D9s and so forth you could level it all down. But back then that was not possible. And so what they have to do is they sort of push the thing together. At the same time, this idea that the central building might be a rotunda, and I'll come back to this in a minute because there's a source for this, is important. And so what we wind up with is a scheme that we have right here, and this is the plan that we all know. It's been reproduced millions of times, uh, so forth, the so-called Maverick plan right here. Uh, in which you have rotunda, you have your five pavilions to either side, you have the gardens, you have the ranges and the hotels behind. But what I'm trying to emphasize, this doesn't happen just like magic. There's lots of different thoughts that go into it. And one of the fascinating things that happens, uh, come on in. Uh, one of the fascinating things that happens is that if you do go over to Special Collections and look at the drawings there, uh, you'll see, for instance, this. Jefferson has done one scheme, then he's cut something out and he shoves something back in you can virtually see him thinking and trying to revise. And of course, back at this point in time, we didn't have Xerox machines, things that you could duplicate. Drawing was a laborious type of an activity. And so I'm not going to redraw the entire damn thing, just snip, 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 
Out you come, shove something back, shove something back in there. So it doesn't just one magical, one magical design. Now, turning to the rotunda, which I just showed you that Mr. Latrobe uh, suggested. He is very responsible for the design of this. And indeed, on this drawing right here, it's inked out right up here in the corner. This is Jefferson's right here. And this label library down here. But if you hold this up to an infrared light, you'll see the name Latrobe up there that's been inked out. Now, why did that happen? The reason why it happened, we think, is Latrobe had been the architect of the United States Capitol from 1803 to 1817. But in 1817, there is a lot of trouble up there, the reconstruction after the British burned it. And he had gotten in trouble with James Monroe, who was the president and ultimately quits. And Monroe is pretty PO'd at him. Monroe is on the Board of Visitors down here. Is Jefferson going to bring in a drawing and show the Board of Visitors to Monroe, who's mad at Latrobe, you understand, with his name on it? So this is my supposition of the reason why that is inked out. Uh, in other places, it is. Uh, he notes that it is drawn upon uh, this, uh, 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 the Pantheon uh, in the Book of Palladio, the Leone edition of Palladio. What is also, though, interesting here is that Jefferson has put in a dotted line showing a sphere, a circle. And this goes to one of the notions that was very prevalent in the late 18th, early 19th century, that there were certain ideal forms of nature, circles, spheres, cubes, and you should embody them in your buildings. And so that's what he is attempting to do with that there. But what is also very interesting is that if you go up to the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, where there is another huge treasure trove of Jefferson drawings, a long story why they're up there, but they're up there, and you dig through them, you'll come up with this drawing here by Jefferson. It's very clear, it's his handwriting. Look at this plan, ovals, H of representative, Senate, courts of justice, passage and stairs. This is virtually the basement floor plan of the rotunda here. He had apparently done this as near as we can figure out, back in 1791, and suggested it, we think, to Washington, who was the president, and apparently Washington rejected it. We do know that he also did do a plan for what is today the White House, and that was also rejected. But what Latrobe is really doing here to, I think, is he's saying, hey, you had a great idea back there. Let's reuse it. And then there's nothing more flattering than, you know, oh, you had a great idea. Let's reuse that idea again. That's very, very flattering. And so in any event, there is, it's a, it's, in other words, the point here is that the story of the design of the University of Virginia is a complicated sort of a thing.